Hello and welcome back to jump to it for irishracing.com. In today's show, we're going to fire into this weekend's upcoming racing, headlined by, of course, the Clarence House, Energamin against Shiskin. Plenty to talk about with that race, as well as the Winter Million at Lingfield and plenty more, including action over in Thurders and Navin over in Ireland. So we're going to bring in the team now just to go straight into it. We've got Stephen Harris, triumphant return from a couple of weeks off. Stephen, I have to ask you, first of all, how are you? Yeah, I'm better. Th thanks, Joe. I'm off my deathbed, Omnicron deathbed. Um, <laughs> yes, I had a week of flu and a week to recover, but we're in Cheltenham. I think it's seven and a half weeks, isn't it? Not long now. racing yep. this weekend is absolutely fantastic. So it's great to be back. Well, that's it, Ed Quigley. Yeah, you dropped the, the bomb there, the trademark, not long now. <laughs> How is the buzz in the town of Cheltenham? Is, are people starting to get excited around where you are? I wouldn't have a clue. I just talk to myself these days. That's the, uh, the first sign of man, as they say, but it's been a sign for quite a long time. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, religiously going through the uh, anti-post markets at midnight and stuff. So um, yeah, it's probably the reason my wife's not talking to me at the moment. But anyway, yeah, it's uh, the, 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 there's not much of a buzz in the town centre yet, but I went went down past the course yesterday. Yeah, looks if I'm fed. So all the early signs of a lot of the the, the infrastructure of some of the hospitality arrangements starting to go in already. So, yeah, there's, there's a sense of it all simmering under, uh, I think you say, Joe. But, no, Stephen touches upon on serious note. Um, you can moan about small fields all you like. This is some serious racing uh, this weekend in itself. Uh, obviously, we'll have knock-on effect and implications for the Channel Festival, but um, some really good stuff to get stuck into. Yeah, and Vincent View as well. Some, some big uh, racing as well over in Ireland. Just give us a quick rundown of some of the highlights for you, especially on Sunday. Well, we've we've won potentially good race on Sunday, but again, we haven't got declarations at this stage. But Alaho, it's a race that Alaho won last year before going on to win the Ryanair in Cheltenham. Um, he's entered, and there's some very good horses entered here. There's eight of them that have entries that are rated one five three or higher, including Alaho on a one seven four, and you've got Fakir Dudares who had been um, entered as well for a race in Linkfield at the weekend, but seemingly comes over to Ireland and will stay or stays at home in Ireland and will race here. Not certain Alaho will run at this stage, but it's a very interesting contest with some nice horses like Notebook, Battle Over Doy and Sam Crow and Daily Tiger, which was second to Energamine the last day. So lots of lots of things to look forward to in that particular race. Well, you bring up a Nergamine, so that leads us on nicely to our first feature race that we're going to talk about, the Clarence House Chase at Ascot. Now, Stephen, I want to bring you in here as well. Just take us through your thoughts on the favourite Shiskin uh, against the Nergamine. What kind of contest are we expecting here on Saturday? Well, the, the only is Hitman. We've got four runners. Um, I thought the prices were about, right? I think um, to 100, I had it four to six Shiskin, two to one in Nergamine, 16 first flow, and 100 the rag, which is exactly 100%. Um, this is tactics. First flow is an Ascot horse. He's a bang front runner. David Bass will be riding him. From the tape, he will be extremely aggressive. And I think that's a big negative to the chances of Inurgamine, who I think can dictate himself. So it's set up for Shishkin. Um, Shishkin will sit third. Amuna Gold will be 300 yards behind Shishkin, hoping for accidents and to pick up some prize money. It should be a clean run race. They're going to go like the clap. I would say the ground will be good to soft, no softer at Ascot. Uh, another couple of dry days ahead. Sunny, clear days forecast. I know it doesn't dry out that quickly this time of year, but it won't be desperate ground by um, I think first flow is going to make it a proper test and set it up for Shishkin. And I think Shishkin will win impressively in the end, having briefly looked in a bit of trouble turning for home when Nico starts to flap. But he'll power home up the straight, and I think he'll pick them off. I, I think if you can get bigger than six to four on, it's probably a very fair price. And Ed, let's just get your uh, take on it as well. I mean, the build up to the race, there were kind of, yeah, people were doubting that these two were going to clash at this stage going ahead of the champion chase. But what was your reaction? Oh, it's great, isn't it? It's great for racing. I said, I've got no, I repeat on this show, I've got no problem with small fields if all the, the big stars are clashing. You know, I'd much rather have this than a 12-runner race where nine of them are also ran just to say, oh, look, we've got a double-figure field. I mean, no, this is serious. Uh, um, two unbeaten chasers, locking horns, you know, two of the best in the game. And it'll be really interesting to see. I agree with what Stephen's saying in terms of the tactics. I mean, first flow, 
will get on with things, especially over the, this trip, back in his backyard, if you like. You know, let's not forget, forget he won this race 12 months ago. Ground's going to be on the, the slowish side, which will suit him. And uh, this will be run at furious gallop. No hiding place over two miles, especially in the jumping department. But uh, I think on balance, this is pretty much priced up how I'd have it. Uh, I think Shishkin is the most likely winner. There still is this... What is interesting about a race of this nature is there's still two big, really unknowns, especially with a Nergamin in, in terms of how really good is he? I mean, everything we've seen from him has looked exceptional, hasn't it, really? It's very rare you come into like a Clarence House chase without a real handle on how good a horse actually is or what the ceiling and their ability is. We still don't really know uh, is the truth. But on what we do know, I think the prices are right. And um, yeah, I, just a final point on this with Stephen touched upon the ground. You know, it's going to be a mixture of soft, good to soft. Uh, there, there seems to be this narrative that's gone out there. And I think it's from the early days of Nicky Henderson saying Shishkin's such a, a lovely traveller. He must have good ground. But look, he acts on good ground. But if you actually look in the form book, there's no evidence to suggest he doesn't handle soft. I mean, it was very soft at Kempton last time. I mean, he pulverised the Tingle Creek winner by eight lengths. He won a Supreme Novices on ground that was soft, heavy in places. He, he acts with cutting the ground. Don't worry about that. Um, so, as I said, whenever it rains and the ground gets soft, I always find there's a big red herring that all the uh, the Shishkin fans start worrying because the form book, not what uh, Nicky Henderson may may or not say, uh, suggests he, he will handle cutting the ground no problem. And Vincent, for you, I think you were bringing up the chances of a Nergamine as well. Are you still in that camp uh, or do you think Shishkin should just win this one quite comfortably? Well, look, realistically, from, from a point of view of horse racing, we don't know how good a Nergamine is. But how good can he be? Because Shishkin is a seriously good horse. So even even if an Ergamine is the real deal, he still mightn't beat Shishkin. That's the that's the issue here. And then the way the race is going to be run is a bit of an issue. Um, an Ergamine has front run in nearly every race that he's gone in. He's a very slick jumper. I can't see uh, first flow staying with him too long, to be honest. Which if if they go hammer and tongs out in front, but then again they could cut each other's throats. I'd imagine that whatever point an Ergamine gets to the front probably let's say he's in a clear lead from the third last and Shishkin is tracking it's going to be some spectacle to watch it's going to be fantastic I don't know which way to go here the the, the value potentially is maybe there's a there's a, a little bit of value in something like two to one in Ergamine because he could be absolutely fabulous he's such a good jumper that's been the key to him and um, in every race he's been in but he hasn't he hasn't met a Shishkin yet that's the issue isn't it so how good can he be there I, I, I'm really looking forward to it. The bottom line is that whatever happens here, it makes the champion chase be a non-event, realistically, most likely, because one of these is going to win and probably win quite well. It's hard to see on official figures. There's nothing between them, but we, the, those ratings are only um, finger-in-the-air stuff. We've no idea how good an Ergamine is or if he is within a pound or so of Shishkin on official figures. Um, we'll, we'll know after Saturday, and after that, then, it could be just a case that it's a... It's like the um, the the cycle racing in France, where on the Sunday you just go up to Champs Elysees and you've already got the yellow jersey or whatever. One of one of them here is going to be a certainty going to Cheltenham at a very very short price. It's just a case of which one it is. Well, right, that's it. I mean, it should be a fascinating contest either way. And of course, we will be back to review the Clarence House next week. All right, let's move on to now Haydock. We're going to look at the opening race there, the twelve fifty, a two and a half mile Grade Two. Novice chase, six declared in this one. Manella Drama looks to be the highest rated of the horses going in. But Stephen, just take us through some of the, the protagonists here and also your fancy going into this race. Well, I, I thought Shake Em Up Parry here is probably half a good thing, to be honest with you. Um, he revels in testing ground. He's a winner over hurdles at Foss Lass, which is always a swamp last season. He's a giant chasing type, uh, Joe. And he's one of these horses races with his head bowed virtually nose on the floor. He's a very honest, relentless galloper. He actually jumped superbly until he got rid of his jockey on his chasing debut first time out and made amends when heavily supported here over two miles last time. Again, jumping absolutely superbly, having them all cold four out. He, he is stepping up in trip here, which will suit him. He is stepping up in class, but uh, Keelan Woods, but there should be loads more improvement to come. As I say, he's probably running himself to complete fitness. My only slight concern is Ben Pauling seems to have gone back into his shell again. I think he's naught from 12 in the last night, which is a slight concern, but probably nothing to worry about particularly. A lot of these yards, as we've said, go quiet in January. They do the flu jab and loads of them don't run at all. So uh, I wouldn't be too worried about shaking him up, Harry. I, I think he's probably the one who can improve past higher rated rivals in this race. 
And Ed, for you, any kind of value in the the outsiders potentially in this race? No, again, uh, I'm agreeing very much with what Stephen said. I, I really like shaking him up, Harry. I mean, it is an interesting race. Manella Drama is clearly a class act. Of course, he was placed behind my Drogo at eight River hurdles and then hasn't disgraced himself over fences so far. And then there's Papa Tango Charlie, who really is starting to click. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if that horse uh, ends up in one of the big races like the Turners or the Festival Novices Chase at the Festival. I mean, he's really going through the gears. I think he's approved £17 pounds in a couple of months of John Joe uh, since going over fences. So uh, clearly he's probably going to be the market leader. But yeah, I'm with Shake Up, Harry. All his best form on deep ground, flat tracks. Uh, funnily enough, he chased home Shishkin uh, at Newbury um, a little while ago. Uh, I, I just think, yeah, up to two and a half here. He cantered home last time out. Two and a half, soft ground. Uh, this is kind of his... His home turf, if you like. He's a previous winner at this venue as well. He's got a little bit to find on official figures, but I'm always of the view, Joe, that when the ground gets pretty deep and testing, uh, ground could be a leveller and official figures go out the window to some extent. It's pretty much a case of just who can handle conditions on the day. Uh, he definitely will handle them. And if anything, he will, uh, will relish uh, test it in those testing conditions. So, yeah, shake him up, Harry, for me. And how about for you, Vincent? Any kind of interesting angles for you going into this one? Or you, is this one you want to look to avoid? No, not particularly. No, there's a horse in this Manila drama that I like the look of. Um, as Ed was pointing out, second to my Drogo over hurdles last year. This is the first time he's stepping up and trip over fences. He's he's bred for a much longer trip. He's by Flemings Firth out of a King's Theatre mare. No problem with the ground, no problem with the trip. I think you'll see an improved performance there. Uh, Brian Hughes in the saddle. Depends, it depends on the way the race is, uh, is run, but I, I could see him certainly being a contender here and probably worth a little bit of a bet. Lovely stuff. All right, well, let's move on to the next race, which is the Supreme Trial. Uh, we've got John Bond, of course, the odds on favourite here. But Stephen, do you think there could be any kind of upset or is John Bond, is it, is it basically just a walk in the park? No, it's definitely not a walk in the park. I don't think so. Anyway, I really like uh, Donny Boy here of Nick Alexander's. Now, this goes against the grain completely. I bore people relentlessly. Northern forms are stone worse than the South and UK forms at least a stone uh, worse than Ireland. But I mean, in this instance, Donny Boy, who's about 14 to 1 or bigger on the exchanges against Don Boy. Donny Boy, I mean, I've never seen anything like it. Kelso in that bumper. He was pulling his jockey's arms out and he went through the field like a knife through butter. Now, he might have been beaten absolutely nothing, but it was absolutely an incredible performance. And he did a very similar thing on his hurdling debut at Newcastle, again against Northern Nothing, but. It was very, very impressive. He hasn't settled yet. I'm hoping he'll settle here. Now, John Bond is a horse held in, obviously, the highest regard, priced accordingly on, on uh, reputation and all the rest of it. But he's won on good to soft three times. He's a hard puller. He had the run of the race at Ascot last time. I'm not sure that amounts to a great deal. Um, he's now into Haydock soft ground. Well, if you've watched Haydock over the last six months or so, or even six years, they finish absolutely unconscious there every race. I mean, I don't know whether it's to do with Kirkland's old watering over the last 20 years or the fact they seem to get foss less like rain every meeting, but they are absolutely legless every single meeting. Now, John Bond is a speed horse. He's Aintree on good ground in the spring. He's not Haydock on heavy ground in January for me. He's five to two on. He may well win. He might, might well completely outclass them and Donny Boy won't be good enough, but what I've seen of Donny Boy, if he was trained by Henderson or Nichols, he'd be 9-2 to two here, not 14. And he's a really, really exciting prospect. I'm going to have go for a touch with him. I think he's a big price, 14-1. to one. Lovely. Well, potentially they're a bit of value going against John Bon. Uh, Ed, let's bring you in here as well. I mean, how good is John Bon in your opinion? Uh, clearly very good. Uh, again, all these unexposed novices at like the embryonic stage of their hurling career, we don't really know what they're going to develop into. You know, some of them are future chasers, some of them are going to be future champion hurdlers, uh, all going to have different paths. And John Bond, um, looking in his pedigree, obviously, with the Duvan angle, could pretty much do it all if he, if he kind of keeps it in the family, if you like. But um, yeah, uh, again, Stephen makes a good point. I mean, we all moan about um, trainers not running their horses enough. And uh, it, sometimes Nicky Henderson comes in for a bit of stick on that front. But it is rather interesting of all the races you could run John Bon in. You go to Haydock in, in a bog mm -hmm. to run John Bon. I thought the, they might have looked at perhaps the contender's hurdle at Sandown, uh, but, mm -hmm. which I believe, though, Constitution Hill is going to go for. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe it's just a case of, look, they feel they've got to get a run into him somewhere ahead of the Cheltenham Festival. And this is it. Um, look. 
what will be interesting will be the uh, collateral form line take. Obviously, Mai Tai is second favourite, and he was absolutely thumped 14 lengths at, uh, at Sandown by Constitution Hill. So it'd be an interesting, from a collateral form point of view here, how the kind of two of them uh, shape up, if you see what I'm saying. We know Constitution Hill handles deep ground. Um, will it be how will John Bond handle it? I think Aidan Coleman's going to have a little bit of his job on his hands here. They... He'll want some to try and make the make the running and tow them along at a good pace in this this kind of ground. He won't want a, a messy tactical affair in, in deep ground that could see him come unstuck and a few alarm bells go off. But yeah, interesting listening to uh, Stephen's point about Donny Boy. I mean, I, I I got to admit I haven't really paid much attention to him until I watched the replays last night. And yeah, I mean he, he's won hard hell twice, hasn't he? I mean the horse he beat in Newcastle was rated 107 last time out, but I mean he, he didn't come off the bridle to beat him. So that's the great unknown race. Lots of unexposed types. John Mon should win, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't be getting involved uh, at two to five in a bog in a small field um, up at up at Haydock. Not for me. And Vincent, do you share that view? I mean, yeah, it should John Bond just be the too, too good really here? And then moving on to then going against Constitution Hill as well, of course, in the Supreme. Then what would be your take based on John Bond's performance here? Well, like John Bond, he cost a fortune is the first thing. Five hundred and seventy grand he cost. Mm. He's so far won forty back. He, he if he wins this, he gets another twenty eight and a half. Brings him up to seventy. He's still got half a million to <laughs> to, to win him prize money before he gets back his purchase price. Like how long is that going to take? Pound behind you, Vincent. Pound behind yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's where he is. Pound <laughs> behind me. Um, but the bottom line is, the last day he ran, he beats a horse, an Irish horse called Colonel Mustard, two and three quarter lengths. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. It's good enough to win here, but it's not good enough necessarily to be beating the likes of Constitution Hill and the Supreme um, in Cheltenham. Like that's a different level of form he's going to have to to produce. I'd like to think he can produce it here. Probably in this ground, he probably can't. Is the answer? Um, as as the boys are alluding to. Probably needs better ground. Springtime Cheltenham would probably suit him, but this isn't his his ideal uh, scenario. And I, I wouldn't be putting people off that Donny Boyd that Stephen fancies at a, at a price. He won a, a four-year-old point-to-point in Drumahan, uh, won it well. There's a couple of other horses in behind that day. The second and the fourth have won on the track as well. So probably a reasonable level, a, a reasonable type of horse coming from Ireland. Those four-year-old point-to-pointers, they tend to, to ex, uh, be exchanged for big money afterwards. So reasonably good performance from that and the two runs in england are two wide margin wins obviously at a, at a low level but he could still be anything he's definitely got a big um question mark behind how good is he and we'll find out is he at this level he probably isn't to be truthful but at the same time at 14 to 1 he looks like a little bit of a poke all right great stuff all right well let's move on to the next race on the card at haydock at the two o'clock which is a champion hurdle trial race in name but, I mean, you've got Tommy's Oscar here, the odds-on favourite, who is a long poke for the actual champion hurdle itself at Cheltenham. But, Stephen, let's just take this race in kind of isolation. Tommy's Oscar, the deserving favourite for you? Well, I think he might be vulnerable. I mean, it's not often that Musselboro handicap hurdle winners are talked about in sort of champion hurdle terms. Mm-hmm. He won last time out. He's a very progressive and likeable horse. Uh, and his trainer, Anne Hamilton, do, does very well with a small team of horses. When he won at Muster, he was quite free. He didn't settle particularly well. And looking back through all of his form, it tends to be on good to soft ground. He did win at Musselboro on soft ground a season or two ago. I'm not, again, sure he wants Haydock on heavy. I can see him pulling in the early stages. Uh, Global Citizen is going to lead and go a good gallop, I would have thought. I think it's probably set up for a horse who's old enough to smoke now, Hunter's Call, who's 12. I mean, it's not too often you'll be tipping up a 12-year-old to win a a champion hurdle trial. But, I mean, the other thing to say about Hunter Scott, he ran a screamer in the International at Cheltenham, a race I like with Guard Your Dreams. I thought that was pretty good form. Um, Ollie Murphy, who went missing for a month, I think he was one from 50 um, over a month period um, after Christmas, is now back in form. He's had six winners in the last 14 days. Hunter's call was running well, comes here freshened up, um, should go on the ground. Aidan Coleman's booked. I can see... Hunter's goal might just have too much pace for the favourite. It, it looks a match. It, it's a truly shocking race for the money. I think Unibet have pulled up 75 grand for this. And basically, they've got about four 10-year-olds and a 12-year-old running against a, a handicap hurdle winner at Musselburgh. So I shouldn't think they're going to be too thrilled by the turnout. Well, yeah, hopefully there, there could be some value in the old boy yet, uh, Hunter's call. Cool. But uh, Ed, get your point of view on this race. I mean, do you share that view of, yeah, potentially there's some value in? The old dog? Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's it's uh, 
it's a, it's a champion hurdle trial in uh, in name, isn't it? Really. Well, look, look it's, what, on the wider point here, what's interesting is Tommy Zoska. Uh, someone could correct me if I'm wrong. Is the highest rated uh, British challenger with an entry in the champion hurdle? Uh, quite a, remar- a remarkable. Really. I think Anne Hamilton was commenting about it on the other day. Up to one five six now. You know, overtaking Epiton, of course, his previous champion hurdle winner. Quite remarkable uh, mm. the rise of this horse. But um, yeah, uh, I mean, I think was he's around a. 101 poke to win at Preston Park in eight weeks. That pretty much tells you all you need to know. I, I'd, if I was going to have a bet in it, which I haven't, I'd be tempted to roll the dice with Global Citizen, who um, is for the Ben Paulding team. We've gone a little bit quiet. However, he's had a wind up since last time out. He ran in this race, uh, I think it was three years ago, and absolutely bolted up. He built Speed Silver Streak and a few others, some pretty good horses. He's clearly not the force of old, but he's a double figure price. He's a course and distance winner. And say, if that wind up's done the trick, um, an improved display uh, wouldn't be a, a biggest shock here. Like, it's a bit of a muddling affair. It's full of a lot of horses scratching around for form, a lot of horses who's had their day. And yeah, uh, Global Citizen is the uh, kind of, you know, he's sixth down in the market out of seven uh, for a horse who's been there and done it. Uh, yeah, I think he's 16 to one. He would be my uh, my kind of tentative pick. Lovely. Another long shot from you there, Ed. Uh, but for you, Vincent, just take us through your thoughts and I mean, your reaction to what the guys are saying as well, the potential value going into this race. I the, the funny thing is here, if you look at last year, last year was a three-runner race. You had Beauvoir there, Baliandi, and Navajo Pass. Navajo Pass on the day was back from 12s into 4s to win that. That was some punt in the last few minutes before that race last year. Um, say he doesn't look to have a chance this year, realistically, because he's he's having to give um, £6 to Tommy's Oscar. That's probably undoable um, at this stage anyway for the, for the likes of Navajo Pass. I, I don't really think I'd have a bet in this. I couldn't I couldn't see any value in it. Like four to six, Tommy's Oscar. It's short, probably win, in my opinion. And then the second favourite, there's not a huge amount of juice left in that either. Hunter's called it. But 13 to eight, seven to four. So I'd be staying out of it. Fair enough. So let's move on next to the uh, big race on uh, from the Haydock car, the 235, the Peter Marsh Handicap Chase, over three miles just over. So yeah, we have Royal Pagal, uh, Pagil however you say it, uh, at the head of the market. Of course, last year's winner as well. So, Stephen, they, take us through your thoughts on this race. Some big names, some interesting angles going into this one. Yeah, I've got it down to two. I don't particularly fancy Royal Pagar. Um, I think he's handicapped to the hilt now, carrying these lumpy weights in this sort of ground. Very, very tough ask. And if you watch the run back against A Plus Tard, the Gold Cup favourite, I mean, he had a very, very hard race. I know he's been given time to recover from it, but... He really was legless from a long, long way out there. Wouldn't be for me under top weight. Having said that, Venetia Williams continues to dumbfound with her horses. When you fancy them the least, they win by further, I find. And obviously, she's deep ground to no issue and done it before and all the rest of it. My two would be uh, Stealing Ed's horse, Al Nadam, who's got his ground. Mm. Um, He must go well, I'd have thought. I think they probably did a bit too much too soon last time out in the middle of the race. I think he needs waiting with them producing late he's a funny horse he, he ran well last time and ridden more patiently he should go well but the one i like was philip hobbs's kaluki uh, who's a young chaser on the up uh, still got a bit to learn about jumping i thought it was a pretty amazing performance to win at doncaster last time second run back all of hobbs's horses have needed a run all of his handicappers and they've improved dramatically second run back and i think kaluki can improve again he didn't jump particularly well at doncaster he had an awful lot to do a long way out but he kept galloping, kept putting his head down and found plenty for pressure. I think this stiffer test of stamina will suit him. He's only had seven runs over fences. There should be more to come. I think he's around 10 to 1 now. Um, he makes plenty of appeal. Well, that's a good hint, actually, at what your tip is later on in the show, Stephen. You're kind of giving it away a little bit. Uh, but, Ed, I'll bring you in here as well. Yeah, Stephen touched on it, the form of Venetia Williams. What's it, 24% strike rate in the last 21 mm-hmm. days? Uh, so, yeah, take us through that, uh, the form, and can you really ignore it at this stage? Oh, I mean, she's absolutely flying, isn't she? And she's, uh, we normally associate Venetia, if want a better phrase, with a lot of very good handicappers. But we've seen with um, a few of the horses she's getting coming through this year, a lot of novice chases as well. She could have... Um, in terms of the Charlotte Festival in a couple of months' time, I have a few lively each way shouts to some of the, the graded races. And obviously, Royal Pagai is a horse that's taken her to these graded contests. Uh, like all good journalists, though, Joe, I don't have the data to back it up in front of me while I'm, <laughs> while I'm broadcasting. But Royal Pagai, 
to win a British handicap off a mark of BHA rating of 163. I think that probably would put him in the top 15 performers of all time to defy a handicap mark. Mm -hmm. uh, I did see the stat and I'm, I'm not meant I managed to find it again since, but <laughs> essentially it's a mammoth ask. I mean, he won this race last year. That was off 156. Yes, he's two from three at Haydot, all his former soft ground, but to defy 163, he's going to have to run to a mark of around 170, which pretty much puts him in the kind of, uh, you know, the, the gold cup, kind of top three class, which is, is debatable whether he is or not. So I think he's there. He's soaking up a lot of the market. And I think he's there to be got at. All Nadam's going to drive me mad if this horse wins. The grounds wasn't deep enough for him at Cheltenham last time out, unfortunately. They were wanting more rain. And I thought perhaps, as Stephen says, uh, I think maybe um, Harry Skelton maybe forced the issue a little bit too soon with him and uh, maybe a waiting game under Bridget Andrews here may be in store because that is going to be the issue with Elna Dam here up to up to this uh, extended three miles, one furlongs on testing ground. Uh, the Petrolite came on for this horse in the Ultima over the same trip. Uh, this is going to be more testing ground. I think uh, I think a change of tactics could easily be in store. Uh, and if Bridget Andrews can kind of just smuggle the horse into the race, he's going to have his mm. conditions. And I think he's dangerously well treated off one four one. So I'm almost talking myself into a bet uh, with uh, all of them. But essentially, I would be against the favourite at the prices. I mean, five to two uh, in a few places here, Royal Park, to mm. defy a mark of one six three. Uh, that you know, you're getting into epic handicap weight carrying perf uh, performances, and when you start looking at those type of statistics, yeah. And Vincent, do you share that view? I mean, given the the yeah the, the weight difference or the weight that he has to overcome, Royal Pagal is it a line through kind of job, or yeah, is there some no. worth backing? Yeah, enough for me. I think there might still be a little bit of value in this, depending on the way it works out. There's going to be a lot of people opposing the horse because of the rating and, and having to defy uh, such a high rating and a handicap. But at the same time, it's a Venetia Williams horse. Are flying they all go in very very testing ground that's the key as well this horse carried 11 stone 10 to win the, the race last year by 16 lengths he carries 11 stone 10 again this year I, i'm i'm struggling to find out and to beat this horse because i think whatever beats it wins ultimately uh royal pagai has to be involved like i i agree with stephen got a hard race against the plutar the last day was a long way behind it as well but had some very decent horses in behind that day and pulled up that day it's it's probably not a bad run. It's at a much higher level than than a, than a handicap for certain. Uh, I'd be inclined to think it was off at just over two to one last year. Was the SP? You're looking at three to one ish at the minute. If you happen to be getting seven to two uh, by the time of the race, I'd be inclined to think that's probably a bet. I think that's fair enough. Yeah. So like I say, we'll come back and review these picks uh, next week as well, just to see if any kind of, anything kind of stands out. But now we're going to move on to Lingfield. And on Sunday, we've got a couple of feature races we want to discuss as well. Now, Ed, I just want to bring up or bring it up first, the whole the Winter Million concept. What do you make of it at Lingfield and how good it, will it be for racing? Well, Joe, yeah, I mean, it's something fresh. It's something new, isn't it? Um, we always, we, we kind of bang the drum on these type of shows uh, to the cows come home about January being a really boring month other than the kind of the, you know, you've got the Tollworth, the Clarence House Chase and Chatham's Trials Day. That's kind of three days out of 31 in January and no one really turns their TV set on on the other occasion. So something new, something fresh, I, I'm never going to complain with. And also, like, it is quite niche in the sense that, you know, you're going to get, testing a bog there mm. so if you've got a horse you want some mud you know we've had loads of trainers moaning you didn't rain for three months during the autumn well you've got no excuses here if you've been waiting sitting on a mud lark in your stable now's the time to go and run it in what will be a for pretty good prize money however um lingfield at the end of january um can be like an amazonian swamp and when you throw in the fact we've got um arctic blizzards coming in over uh, the southeast there's a chance this meeting won't go ahead which will be an absolute kicking the teeth for all involved with the inaugural Winter Millions. But yeah, it's concept in itself. I welcome it. It's, you know, we moan about things being a little bit mundane in January. This is fresh. This is exciting. And it's attracted some good horses. So yeah, I, as a general rule, I'm all for it. Whether in the long term, uh, Lingfield would be the track. I'm not sure. Maybe there is an argument perhaps to rotate it. Uh, mm. around tracks uh, season by season. I'm sure that someone way above my pay grade uh, will be discussing that type of thing because, yeah, Lingfield in January can A, get very testing and there's always the danger, of course, it, it could get called off as well. So something to chew the fat over, shall we say. Well, as things stand, I mean, the meeting is going ahead as far as we know. So let's crack on to the 225 on the Sunday, the uh, Cheltenham Festival betting guide hurdle. Here we've got some Brave Man's game is in, the, uh, sorry, let me start again. Bring up a storm is in this one where we have, uh, yeah, the head of the market. So Ed, just take us through it while we we're talking about it with you already. Brewing up a storm, you like the look of this one, right? Um, I think he's got it. He's, he's the right. 
he'll be the right favourite. He is the favourite. Um, I mean, officially rated one five eight, and um, of course, I think he probably would have won last time out uh, if he hadn't fallen before that entry. He looked in in great form. Uh, but it sounds like Dashiell Drasher might have a crack at this. Of course, he's a horse who's back over hurdles and will love this ground. Uh, I, I know S- Stephen's going to get his bazooka out and, and shoot me down here, but <laughs> call me mad. I actually think Goshen's got a proper chance. This is the first oh. race all season. He might actually have a chance of winning it. I keep saying it every time. We get all this right-handed, left-handed, doesn't travel, doesn't do this. All his form is on heavy <coughs> ground. He's never won a race for Gary Moore over hurdles on ground at least doesn't have the word soft or heavy somewhere in it. All his form is in a bog. Uh, Ascot last time out good to soft he was no good he ran on rattling quick ground the time before it was no good he came over to punches down the sun had been out for three days it was no good his form in heavy ground is very good now there is a chance he's not quite the force of old and you know etc 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 if he lines up for this I'd be in heavy ground over two and a half miles I'd be willing to take a chance you know Gary Moore one of his local tracks conditions are going to be absolutely spot on for him whereas I'm not te- necessarily convinced there will be for a few of the others in here. So that would be my angle with him. Um, I'd be interested to see if he's declared, I will back him. But he's got multiple entries this weekend. So consequently, I, I do have to sit on the fence for now. Go on then, Stephen. Get your bazooka out. Are you going to shoot down <laughs> no, Ed? I, and go I, actually, I think Ed's made a very good case there. I mean, uh, he's absolutely right. Because the last time Goshen ran on heavy ground, he won the Kingwell. And he won it by 22 lengths. And they were all absolutely gasping about a mile out in behind him. It, it was an incredibly destructive performance. And at that time, people thought he'd win the, the champion hurdle. And I think the wheels have fallen off since. He's a horse. Who, I think that he's got physical issues. I, I know it's been well documented in the past. It, he carries his tail at a funny angle, which is usually a sign of a, a back problem or something like that. I'm sure Gary Moore knows a lot more about it than I do. That's for sure. But um, I, I don't think he's a horse who's been easy to train. But heavy ground at Lingfield, well, he could be the one to be. I wouldn't be surprised if he bounced back. And... Um, Gary Moore's had seven winners in the last 14 days. They've backed all of them off the boards. I mean, they're absolutely flying at the minute. I think his, his strike rate is pretty incredible. Wouldn't be at all surprised if Goshen bounced back. I mean, the one who looks well-treated here getting the mayor's allowance is Miranda down the bottom, who Cobden's jocked up to ride. She was a remarkable winner of a Ludlow handicap last time out, where she got left 15 lengths at the start and still won. I'd respect her, but going back through all her form, She's not a heavy ground mare. She's a good to soft, really, at worst. So I'd be worried about the ground for her. And, and the top one who's clear on ratings, brewing up a storm, maximum respect, the yard's back in form. He'll be a short price favourite and hard to beat. He was very unlucky last time. I don't need a one, got rid of Coleman at the last, but he'd run well up to a point. He's probably clear on the ratings, clear on form. But yeah, interesting race. I, I wouldn't put anyone off Gosh, and I think Ed's made a very good case for him. I've gone oh, off lightly there, and I was waiting for that. Like... <laughs> 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 Did dodge a bullet there, Ed. All right, well, let's move on now to the three o'clock as well at Linkfield, the Fleur de Lis chase, where we did have Fakir Duderi as entered in the race, but obviously that's now going over to thirders. Um, Bristol Demai might be lining up. Stephen, uh, your old mate, I know you tipped him up on the goal, for the Gold Cup previously, uh, but what do you make oh, of his yeah. chances for this race? Yeah, that was that was about the 1984 Gold Cup, to be fair, <laughs> 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 um, guilty as charged um, it's a hard race I, I quite like Master Tommy Tucky I don't think Huntingdon although he's won there is his track uh, he tends to jump out to the left and I think left handed at Lingfield on soft ground would be ideal for him he's a high class horse he's just one of these horses Master Tommy Tucker he's not a grade one horse he's about a grade one and a half he's best dictating whether or not he'll be able to we don't know the final decks I don't know but he's got his ground uh, I think left-handed round here on testing ground will really suit him. He should go well. Um, we'll have to wait and see the final runners before having any firmer opinions. Okay, well, that leads us on to the actual where Fakir Duderi is actually declared. And Vincent, I'm going to bring you in now for the 3.15 at Thurders, potentially against Alaho as well. So yeah, give us your breakdown of this race. Well, firstly, he's not actually declared. He's intended to run there, but we've no actual yeah. declarations yet. But yeah, this this could be a, a hell of a race if a lot of them turn up. Alaho is the is the big is the big draw if he comes, but there's potentially he won't because the Cheveley Park owners were talking about going straight to Cheltenham. So it's interesting that the horse has been entered here in the first place. It's a race he won last year before going to Cheltenham. I, I'd imagine that he probably will turn up. Thurless is a nice track. They're easy enough fences, and um, it's a straightforward enough. 
track you you tend to get good winter ground I, I think willie mullins would be keen to go if he if he wants to get another run into the horse and probably will after the the john durkin performance it didn't jump that great in the john durkin and i think he'd like maybe to get another uh pop around fences for him on a racetrack it would do him no harm i in fact you darius would obviously be a danger but he's 12 lengths behind him in cheltenham last year so i i would be inclined to think that wouldn't uh scare off willie mullins so I, I think Alaho will probably turn up if he does. It's going to be a hell of a race with Fakudu Dairies. You've got the likes of, there's a, quite a few Gigginstown horses in here as well. Notebook, uh, Battle Over Doyen, Sam Crow and, and Daily Tiger. Daily Tiger is one that I quite like the look of from an each way point of view, depending on how many runners we get here. The Noel Mead horse has run a couple of times over hurdles recently. Um, but if you go back, his last run over fences was in December when he was eight and a half length second in Cork to Energamine. Um Obviously, he was no match for Energamine, but at the same time, it was probably a decent effort. He's won a bumper here in Thurlis, and he was second in a hurdle race as well. So at an each-way price, if if we get eight runners or more, I'd be inclined to think Daily Tiger could be one worth having a go at. Great stuff. Well, of course, there's plenty more racing at, uh, over in Ireland as well on Sunday. But now we're going to move on to our tips of the weekend. So, Vincent, I'd like to start with you as well, because you've got a couple for us from Navin this week, and you did have a winner last weekend as well. Yeah, yeah, got a winner last weekend, which was nice to get School Lane. Um, one, one well, an amazing thing about School Lane was it was always up at the pace in that particular race, but yet it went as big as 200 to 1 in running on Betfair, which was a real surprise. I don't know what went on in the in-running market on it. Um, anyway, that got up, got up in the photo finish in one, one half of that, I think it was. This weekend, I fancy a couple of horses. They're both J.P. McManus-owned horses running in Navin, so it's probably a silly thing to do to be trying to um, second-guess the J.P. horses in, in handicaps particularly. But at the same time, the first one, Damalisk, runs in the 140 in Navin Saturday. It's a 17-runner handicap, um, which you'd think would be very competitive, but it doesn't look to be too competitive. Tiger Roll is top weight, um, so he's only having a, a prep run for Cheltenham stroke wherever he may go mm -hmm. afterwards at this stage in the season but he, but he's, he's 12 years of age I wouldn't be worried about the likes of Tiger Roll in the race out of the 17 runners only one of them won last time out that was another JP McManus horse called Shady Operator he won a cross country race in Punchestown so a lot of these are out of form and Damalis he won the race last year off a rating of one two three he's off one three five that's 12 pounds higher this year he was a seven and a half length winner last year one from two more JP McManus uh, owned horses finished second and third his two runs this season I, I think i like the way he's going here and i can see a repeat win on saturday he had a pipe opener in nace over this trip two and a half miles finished sixth of 18 it was a lovely run then he went um for a three mile race in navin back in december didn't appear to stay the three miles wouldn't be the first time he didn't stay it he ran at the um dublin racing festival last year as well over three miles didn't look to quite get home that day either this two and a half is perfect Presuming the Harties have this in good form, which I'd imagine they have, and primed for this. Mark Walsh is back in the saddle. He won He won on him in the race last year. I, I'd be keen to say this will win. Um, all things being equal, it should win. It looks like it's a, it's a weak renewal. And then the other one is in the 215 at Navan. This is a, another handicap. It's a horse called Never Off Duty. This is a Robert Tyner horse. And Robert Tyner's horses are flying at the moment. He had a treble one day at the Limerick over Christmas. Like for a small-time trainer... Having a treble on a day is a fair performance, and he's had a couple of winners since. He's had a, a well-backed winner in Punchestown last week as well. I, I'd be inclined to think this horse has a good chance. Um, Tyner won this race last year with another J.P. McManus horse, so a horse called Sir Bob won it. Um, this Tyner horse finished second. He's a 10-year-old, but he's very lightly raced. He's only had 11 starts, and that includes a point-to-point -point win. He comes here. He's £2 um, up for a decent second in Nace last month. That was a fair performance. There were some nice horses in it. There's another JP horse uh, finished just behind. I think, I think it's called the ABC. Can't remember the full name, but but um, that's one of Niall Madden's, and that would have some sort of a chance as well. And um, the way that ran the last day, but I I think never off duty. Tyner's in such good form. It's a JP horse. They won the pair that won the race last year. I'd be inclined to think that should run very well. Lovely stuff. Well, thank you very much, Vincent. Best of luck with your tips. Now, Ed, I'm going to bring you in here as well. You did tell us last week, it was a bit of a case of you told us so, right, with Caribbean Boy. Yeah. <laughs> Who told you? Who told you? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, those the doubters 
doubters are crying into their uh, their oval tea. Uh, other sleeping supplements are available. No, absolutely. Uh, Caribbean boy, I've been saying harping on, boring everyone to tears, say, as soon as he can get clear around over three miles, he will win off 145. Well, um, obviously, the time before, it, Ascot unfortunately put poor Daryl Jacob on the deck and pretty much put him out for the season, didn't he, at the first flight. He jumped really well, it has to be said. And uh, it was a lovely confidence boost in victory where he needed every yard three miles to get on top. Um, go further forward with him. I still think there's going to be mileage in him. You see what I'm saying? The natural race would have looked to be the uh, the racing post. What was the racing post chase? It kept to next month. But uh, he did. If you watch that race back, Joe, for, for jump to it kind of notebook people, he did actually shift left handed at quite a lot of his obstacles. So I actually think he was kind of a uh, good value for his win, if you like, because I think he gave away a little bit of a ground. So if he went straight to Charlton, something like the Ultima Handicap, uh, back on the left-handed track uh, with three-mile handicap, that would suit him. But yeah, look, it was good to see him back. And it, yeah, he, did, he jumped really well. And that's bring us up to speed with your tips from this week. Um, basically, yeah, because you're in decent form. Well, yeah, again, we were, were kind of getting stuck in all over the place here. I'm, I'm looking at hoping this Lingfield meeting can uh, uh, avoid Jack Frost and it does get the go-ahead. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, uh, Emma Tom in the uh, the Winter Million Hurdle, two miles, seven furlong <coughs> event on Friday. This is a horse who, in the early days, looked an absolute superstar. <coughs> Um, you'll remember he beat the likes of Liz Nagar Oscar in his early days, of course, went on to win the stairs. And Emma Tom himself ran in the stairs hurdle, uh, finishing fourth, where he had the likes of uh, Paisley Park behind him, etc. Uh, he's just, whatever reason, the wheels have come off. However, like all horses, they kind of have their level. And I think this is a feasible opportunity to bounce back. You know, on the blind side, I don't think he, you know, he's had a hard, busy campaign. I don't think he'd want an absolute bog over two miles seven. And Emma Tom's fresh for this. On official figures, he doesn't have much to find. Lots of form in deep ground. And he's, he's a previous winner at the track. So, yeah, Emma Tom would do for me on the Friday. On to the Saturday. We've already touched upon it already, haven't we? Uh, Shaker Matt Parry uh, has a little bit to find on official figures, but he's going to have his ground. He's going to have his track. Uh, and I, I really like the way he jumped last time out at this venue winning over two miles, up to two and a half. That'll be no problem. And then on Sunday, uh, this is in the Fleur de Lis chase, the aforementioned contest we touched upon. There's a lot of pensioners or nearing them, um, nearly as old as you, Joe, in this lineup. You know, we've got Master Tommy Tucker at the age of 11, Bristol Demise 11. Uh, I'm surprised Stephen hasn't tipped his horse. He's been waiting nine years to win, uh, waiting patiently. I believe he's going to line up and run his way. He's going to run. These are all horses, and let's just be blunt, have had their best days. Uh, and especially with two of them, they've got to give six pounds away here to itchy feet. It's a horse who's been called a few names in his time. But again, I'll talk about conditions. It's a horse who's got very good form when it's testing. Uh, he won a grade one at Sandown as a novice when he won the Silly Isles of very soft ground. He was placed in the Supreme Novices behind Classical Dream uh, on, on ground. They called soft. But, I mean, they were coming home in different postcodes that day, Classical Dream won. He's a horse who'd be very happy on soft ground. This season, he's done a little wrong in defeat. You know, he chased home Brave Man's game last time out. That was more or less an impossible task. He bumped into all mankind uh, behind the time before. And again, I've talked about Trip on this show, Joe. He goes up to two miles to six furlongs for the first time over fences. Two miles six in a bog. Proper test of stamina. I think this could bring out the best of him. He's only eight. He's younger. He's fresher legs. He's seven to one. I, I, I think that's a big price. All right, well, hopefully, uh, Stephen, now you're a little bit recovered after your couple of weeks off. Speaking of old dogs with new tricks, what have you got for us this weekend? <laughs> um, well, I, I, we've touched on them before, Joe, left me speechless. Uh, um, Donny Boy, um, who I think is a horse, going to be one of the most exciting horses from the north um, for many, many a year. Nick Alexander, I think he can turn over John Bonnet Haydor. I think, even if he doesn't turn him over, I think he will run a blinder. If he settles for Conor O'Farrell, I mean, he's not dropped the bit yet. He, he sluiced up in a bumper, pulling hard. He was still pulling, turning for home at Kelso. And it was a similar story sent hurdling at Newcastle. If he settles, and I hope something will go a decent gallop, so he will drop the bit, I think he's going to run an almighty race. He's about 14 to 1. I'm going to have a real go with him. Um, hopefully, we can turn over John Bond. And staying at Haydock in the Peter Marsh at 2.35, I was quite taken with Kaluki. He only scrambled home. He had a hard race, but he did quite a lot wrong at Doncaster. If he can jump better with the cheek pieces on, Tom O'Brien up and the increased test of stamina that Peter Marsh demands, I think he'll go really well. He's a double figure price as well. So hopefully we can blast our way back to full health. Great stuff. Well, that wraps it up for today's episode of Jump To It with plenty of 
tips and uh, guides to the upcoming races. Be sure to tune in on Monday because we'll be back with more anti-post previews for Cheltenham, where we're going to be looking at the Arkle, the National Hunt Chase, the Brown Advisory, and the Turner's Chase, formerly the Mar. So be sure to tune in for that. And of course, if you do place any bets on our selections, please do gamble responsibly, and we'll see you again very soon.